Hi everyone, Mark here. Welcome back to the channel and episode 8 of Q&A. Slightly different introduction today. Uh, something I'm going to start doing towards the end of each video is a section maybe a couple of minutes long in support of others. If this is something you're interested in, drop me an email. The address is linked below and we'll arrange for as much information to be included as possible. This could be advertising a small business, mentioning a website or channel, or even something on a personal level, such as an inspirational story. Main thing here, keep it positive. I'm not charging any money or asking for anything in return, just helping others out as Age of the Storm continues to grow. Again, contact details are all linked below in the description, and we'll get back to the video. So, this question is going to lead directly from my last Q&A episode and is from the same person. Who were the two thieves who were crucified with Jesus? If Jesus is the Son, does that mean that the thieves are constellations that we see in winter? So, another great question. I think it's necessary to dig a little bit deeper with this one and to look at the broader picture. By doing this, you will kind of get a better feel for the context. In the way of a quick recap, as we know, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, indicating the sun reaching the constellation Libra, which in ancient Greece formed the claws of Scorpius. Traditionally, this is the constellation which could be found at the fall equinox. This is the point in time where nights become longer than days and darkness overpowers light. Obviously, due to the precession of the equinoxes, the constellation in this area gradually changes over time. Judas Iscariot, or Scorpio, sends the sun to its metaphorical death. Jesus' three days in the tomb symbolised the sun reaching its lowest point and standing still for three days around the winter solstice. From there, the resurrection and ascension are based on the sun progressively moving further north and days eventually becoming longer than nights at the spring equinox. The entire betrayal crucifixion and resurrection are based on the movements and interactions of the sun in this whole area of autumn and winter. There is however a whole other side to this same coin, which I will discuss in a separate video. So let's back up for a minute. Jesus was placed on a cross. Depending on the translations you look at, you will find several verses which talk about Jesus being on a cross. You will also find several verses which state that it was actually a tree. Here are a few examples on screen now. The truth here is they're both as accurate as each other. The best way to explain this is to go back to the Greek word which is translated in these passages. That word is zulon. This can refer to wood in virtually every form, whether it be a tree, wood which has been treated and cut, or even wooden weapons such as a club. That said, when these texts came to be translated again and again over time, we see that the authors have been more specific about the structure which Jesus was hung upon. A tree and a cross. There's a reason for this. The cross is a reference to the cross of the zodiac. This is also the metaphorical world tree, which we can find depictions of throughout many different belief systems. In the Bible, we see it as both the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. You then have the serpent, which is the Milky Way, coiled around this tree. Other examples of this which I often use are the Yggdrasil from Norse mythology and the Bodhi tree from Indian mythology. What we are actually looking at when we see Jesus between two thieves is the sun following its conjunction with Libra. Look more closely at this area during the sunset specifically. Like I said, if we dig a little bit deeper, into Greek mythology, we can find two prominent thieves, called Hermes 
and Autolycus. The name Autolycus translates as the wolf itself. This is a reference to the constellation Lupus the wolf. In the Molapin, this was the Mad Dog constellation. In Egyptian mythology, this was also a much larger constellation, which stood here at the symbolic gates of the underworld. Looking at the position of Lupus, we see it to the left of the sun. This is personified as the impenitent thief, Gestus. Gestus basically means somebody who moans or complains. In the Arabic infancy gospel, you will see the name given as Dumachus. Over to the other side now, in Greek mythology, the thief Hermes is a personification of the planet Mercury. Looking at the position of Mercury at this time, we can find it on the right hand side of the sun. The name given to this thief is Dismas. This is actually derived from a Greek word meaning sunset or death. It can literally mean to the west, also indicating its location. As we also see in the Arabic infancy gospel, the name given here is Titus. This name refers to a title of honour. As the sun progresses through the seasons and ascends at the spring equinox, Mercury, obviously with its close orbit, joins the sun in paradise, exactly as described in Luke 23.43. This is basically why we see two thieves and their specific positioning on either side of Jesus. Looking at this area of the sky where the alignment takes place, you'll probably remember this from one of my previous videos. This is the head of the beast with ten horns from Daniel 7 and later Revelation. This is just outside of the celestial city in a place called Calvary or Golgotha, meaning place of the skull. Again, taking a more broad view, there are other astrological and astronomical elements which mirror the sun between two thieves. With the sun on the cross of the zodiac, we have the equinoxes on the left and right. One steals the daylight in the autumn, while the other steals the darkness in the spring. These various interpretations are things which would have all been considered important in the ancient person's mind. What we may see as ambiguity, they would have seen as balance, one story with many messages. As promised, there are a few other areas which are worth a mention here too. The first being the rods which were used by Moses and Aaron. You might be wondering why this is relevant. Well, this again is something which you won't find in the Bible. So you'll need to look at various other bodies of tradition to find this connection. One story in particular describes Moses actually splitting the tree of knowledge into 12 sections and giving a piece of this to each of the 12 tribes. Now this is where it gets interesting. One section of the tree ended up changing hands several times eventually finding itself in the possession of Joseph, who took it with him on the journey to Egypt. Later, Joseph passed this on to James, the brother of Jesus, before it was stolen by, guess who? Judas Iscariot. It's then said that when Jesus came to be crucified, they could not find any wood for the transverse beam of the cross. It was at this point that Judas produced the staff, and it was subsequently used for that purpose. Another significant element of Jesus' crucifixion is the piercing of his side. If we look at the position of the sun following its conjunction with Scorpius, we see that it enters the intersection of the Milky Way. This has been depicted as the smoke which rises from the altar constellation, Ara. As we know from the flood narrative, it's also depicted as water. 
Following the path of the Milky Way below the ecliptic, we can find the soldier who pierced Jesus' side with a spear. Think back to John 19.34. It was not just blood which flowed from the wound, but also water. Looking more closely now at Jesus' three-day death, many people will be familiar with this being in a cave or tomb. Sources both inside and outside the Bible actually tell us outright that Jesus went to hell. Although this may sound strange, it was a very common view throughout history. The first example of this is the Apostles' Creed. Here you have it point blank. Jesus went to hell. Matthew 12.40 Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If this link between earth and hell sounds familiar to you, then it should. In previous videos, we've looked at similar areas in the Old Testament, where the word used for earth, which is Eretz, was also used interchangeably when talking about the underworld. Ephesians 4.9 He also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. 1 Peter 3.19 is very revealing here as well by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. These are the very same watchers or sons of God that we find in 1st Enoch. Tell this to some of those traditional believers who claim that books from outside the Bible have no merit. If they're taking a literal view of these characters, then clearly 1st Enoch was important to them. What many of you may find interesting here is there are certain texts which elaborate on Jesus emerging from hell with the cross. When he's asked if he preached to the spirits in prison, it's actually the cross which answers yes. So this alone points to the cross being more of a metaphor than a physical wooden structure. While we're following that trail, one interesting tradition tells us the name of a spirit who was in hell with Jesus. His name is Abaddon, the very same spirit who was responsible for collecting dust to make the first Adam. Of course, we are more familiar with this spirit as the constellation Capricornus. Finally, we also see Jesus upon his resurrection and ascension as a giant. Followers of this channel will immediately know what's going on here. We have the sun in the face area of the Orion constellation, which in Aramaic tradition is called Nephilah, the giant. Again, this is something which I've covered in great depth in several previous videos. I'll link to everything we've discussed down below in the description. So, hopefully this answered your question. Please do let me know if there are any areas which you would like me to elaborate on, or you have any other related questions. Likes and shares are very much appreciated, as it helps the channel to grow, and also lets me know that I'm heading in the right direction with the content that you all want to see. Thank you all again for watching, I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you in the next video. So the Vapor Rooms are a small British company based here in Liverpool. They have two stores, one in West Derby, the other in Garston, South Liverpool. And I can personally vouch for these guys, giving my own honest opinion and review. Having previously smoked shisha for a while, I wanted something that was a little bit more healthy and convenient. I did try other vape shops and they basically just wanted a quick sale and to get you out the door as fast as possible. When I walked into the Vapor Rooms, this was completely different. The staff are all really friendly, the product knowledge is extensive, and they can't do enough to help you. But here's the part that won me over. They actually encourage you to stay. 
They've got an area where you can sit down, chill out and relax. Free, freshly brewed coffee, snacks and their range of products and devices are extensive. While the Vapor Room's online store is currently undergoing maintenance, they are able to take orders and payments either through Instagram or over the phone. And although they're based in the UK, they have previously shipped abroad too, so I'd encourage you to check these guys out. If you want to know any more about the Vapor Rooms, I'll link to their Instagram, email and phone numbers below. I'll also leave you now with a video of their own. Thank you.